Hello friends, welcome to another edition of 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. Always a blessing to have each and every one of you joining us every single week and taking this journey in God's Word, a study of God's Word. And um, uh, we're excited because we're studying the book of Mark. We're learning so much of this short but yet very profound gospel. And so before I go any further, I want to remind you of how you can access a copy of our study notes. Um, you probably have heard us tell you this every week, but we all do. Uh, we, we, we study differently. We write notes differently. But if you would like to access a copy of our notes digitally, we need you to email us, okay? Don't go to 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com. Don't submit a request there. Uh, we want you to email us, and here's the email address. It is ssp at 3abn.org. SSP, that stands for Sabbath School Panel, ssp at 3abn.org, and simply just send us an email requesting a copy of the notes, and we'll send those to you. I want to introduce our panel at this time. To my direct left is Ms. Shelley Quinn. How are you, Shelley? I'm very blessed to be here. I have Monday's lesson, Clean Hands or Clean Heart. Amen. Praise the Lord. To your left, we have Pastor John Dinsey. It's a blessing to be here, and I have Tuesday crumbs for the dogs. All right, interesting. And then to your left, we have Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Ryan. I have Wednesday's lesson, which is entitled Tongue Tied. Amen. Praise the Lord. And of course, uh, we have our minute man here, uh, Brother Daniel Perrin. You are stepping in for one of our other panelists that couldn't be here this week. So uh, we know the Lord's going to be with you. What's the title of your Thank lesson? Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. It is Watch Out for Bad Bread. <laughs> that is true. Having worked in a grocery store for many years back in my early days, I can tell you bad bread's not pleasant. Uh, so <laughs> that's certainly something you want to watch out for. Anyways, before we dive into this week's lesson, we'll go ahead and have a prayer, and then we're going to get right into our lesson. And I'm going to ask Pastor John Danzi if you would pray for us. Let's pray together. Our wonderful and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you in Jesus' name, and we thank you. We thank you that we have the opportunity to study this lesson we thank you for the things we have learned, and we know that even now you will teach us things. So we pray for your Holy Spirit, and we ask you to bless all those that watch and listen to this Sabbath school lesson. We ask you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. amen. This week's lesson entitled Inside Out, and our memory verse comes from Mark chapter 7 and verse 15. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. And I know this is one of those passages that many people have questions about and many people misunderstand. And I think, Shelly, you're going to be dealing with that passage in just a few moments. But uh, our lesson study today begins in Mark chapter Chapter 7, and we're going to be looking uh, on Sunday's lesson at the first 13 verses. I'm going to let you guys read. I normally read Sabbath afternoon, but because there's so much information and so many thoughts I want to share from Sunday's lesson, I'm going to jump right into Sunday's lesson. Um, we're going to jump into Mark chapter 7, read verses 1 through 13. And of course, the lesson is asking what relevant truths are presented in this passage. So let's dive right into it. Verse 1 of Mark chapter 7 says, then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash and there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and it says couches. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandments or the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. Verse 9, it says, he said to them, 
all too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, what, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban, that is a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the world, or excuse me, the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. There is a lot to unpack here uh, in these verses. Um, Man, I mean, there's just, there's just so much here when you begin to study this lesson. Uh, you, you, get the, the, you get to jump into the mindset of these Pharisees as we start seeing this over and over throughout, not just the Gospel of Mark, but we see this in Matthew, especially we see it in Luke, and we also see it in John. These, these Pharisees were always out to try to cause Christ to stumble or to catch him in some type of false teaching or something to be able to bring about, uh, uh, you know, some prosecution against him to bring discipline or ultimately obviously in the end they wanted to destroy him and to get him out of the picture because Christ was becoming very popular during this time. But Jesus turns their words on them. It's interesting that they come at him with a tradition and say, whoa, 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 wait, your disciples aren't washing with hands. I'm not going to jump into Shelley's lesson because she's going to explain all of that. But here it wasn't talking about as if Jesus and the disciples were, were not being sanitary. No, 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 no. They weren't talking about washing hands as, as for sanitary purposes. This was a tradition and, and it was a, not a commandment of God tradition. It was something they had put up on and actually, actually rooted from the Levitical priesthood. But they had taken something that was for the Levitical priesthood and now poured it over onto the people and required the average folk of the day to adhere to these as well. And it just became an oppressive tradition that in the same time they're upholding a tradition, Jesus brings out here and says, wait, 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 hold on. You are telling me that I'm not, we're not observing or holding up the tradition of men, but yet full well at the same time you reject the commandments of God. So notice the weightier matters of the law, in this case the Ten Commandment law of God, they were not honoring at all. And Jesus even gives an example here with the uh, situation with the, 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 you know, the teaching of the sons or the children and, the, and, the, and their parents in which they could receive a gift, but then after receiving that gift, they would no longer take care of their parents. And we are supposed to, as according to the commandment, honor our father and mother, and that is to do what we can for them and providing for them and helping them even even in their elderly years. But yet we can see here that the disciples, excuse me, the Pharisees did not adhere to that and they actually taught against that. Jesus calls them out for it. And of course, what we're seeing here in Mark chapter seven in the early verses here is Jesus is calling full well their issue here. They are hypocrites. And we even see this come right around the nature of this in, in Matthew chapter 23. And I wanna read a few verses here just to bring out uh, the nature of what Jesus Christ is addressing here. These are individuals that were very, uh, you know, proud men. They knew the law. They knew the scriptures. They had the scrolls, but yet uh, they were deeply hypocrites, which is why you see Jesus calling them hypocrites over and over and over. They upheld the traditions of men, but made void the law of God. I'm going to start reading here in verse one of Matthew chapter 23. And of course, this is very much in, in the last week now prior to Christ going to the cross. And he's giving his final address to these Pharisees as they have led up to this point and have already begun to plot his death. It says here, then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples saying, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe that observe and do. But notice this, it says, but do not do according to their works for they say and do not do. It goes on to say in verse four, for they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear and lay on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers, but all their works they do to be seen by men. So again, they put heavy burdens and they apply all of these rules and regulations and traditions all the while not honoring the spirit of the very law of God. And even to the letter of the law of God, they were not honoring that or recognizing it. Notice in verse 13 of Matthew 23, but woe to you scribes and Pharisees. Here it is again, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in 
sin. Uh, so again, they were being a stumbling block for the people to really connect to the truth of God's word and being good examples for the people around them. Again, they were true hypocrites and that's what Christ is, is exposing them for. Verse 15 of Matthew 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And when, you, or when he is one, you make him twice, um, twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. In other words, uh, these, they're, 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 they're heavily influential, but not in a good way, a bad way. Teaching the wrong types of teachings, not establishing truth, not living according to the truth, but upholding, again, traditions over the very laws of God. And then verse 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe and mint and anise and cumin and have neglected, here it is, the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith, these you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. He says, if you're going to keep those other traditions, you ought to for sure, especially honor God's law, but yet you have not. It goes on to say in verse 24, blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but the inside, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, verse 26, first cleanse the outside of the cup and dish that the outside of them may be clean also. So again, it's Jesus says it starts on the inside and then it goes out and that's what Jesus is speaking of right here in Matthew chapter seven. Shelley's gonna again talk a little bit more about about what that meant in terms of the washing of the pots and cups and all of that and this tradition and the spiritual meaning behind this. But we see here even into verse 27 as he caps this off into verse 27 and 28 of Matthew 23. Woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which indeed appear beautiful outwardly but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so you also outwardly appear righteous to men but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. What's the title of our lesson this week? Inside Out. And that was the problem with the Pharisees. They did not understand that the cleansing needed to begin on the inside and then carry over to the outside. But what they would do is they would try to appear to everyone else as if they were religious, as if they were following God, as if they were some type of high and mighty being, pious and, and on fire for God. Yet on the inside, they were again, uh, just dead men's bones, having no connection with God, upholding traditions of men and not necessarily uh, upholding the commandments of God and being the correct influential uh, uh, example for the people around them. And this is what Jesus is addressing. And I just want to ask in, clo in closing, my friends, where are you in your stance with the Lord? Do you lean more into uh, onto a pharisaical approach to the gospel like the Pharisees where you expect almost like a, a spiritual policeman, others to live up to, th uh, to certain standards when you yourself do not live up to those standards? Do you put traditional beliefs and ideologies above that of the plain truth and of course the law of God. This was the Pharisees issue and this is what Sunday's lesson is bringing about. It's entitled again, Traditions versus God's Commands. Which one are you going to go for? Traditions are not bad all in of themselves, but if they make void the law of God, you need to address that tradition. Amen. Thank you for that rousing foundational teaching. Very good. I'm Shelley Quinn and I have Monday's lesson, Clean Hands or a clean heart. In Mark 7, 7, we've already seen that Jesus called out his critics because of their oral tradition, saying that you make void the law of God by the traditions of your elders. Now he's continuing in this context, he's going to expose the root problem of the conflict over the oral tradition, which is hypocrisy. And the tradition said that all food was made unclean if it were touched by hands that had not been ceremonially washed. We're not talking sanita uh, something that's sanitized right here. This was a ritual performance, this washing of the hands. So Jesus says in Mark 7 verse 14, when he had called all the multitudes to himself, he said to them, hear me everyone and understand there is nothing that enters a man 
from outside which can defile him. To be defiled means to be made unclean. Unclean meant that it was unholy or unacceptable to God, whereas clean meant that God had sanctified something and set it apart for his purposes. So he says, nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, these are the things that defile a man. So in context, Jesus is discussing the conflict with the traditions of ritual purity. Please, please understand what I'm saying. Some people find this passage of Mark 7, 14 uh, and 15 to be a conundrum, but it isn't. Mm -hmm. Look at the context. Jesus is speaking of oral traditions of ritual purity, not speaking of the laws of clean and unclean animals that were established by God. He says in verse 16, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he'd entered the ho a house away from the crowd, his disciples ask him concerning this parable, the parable being nothing that enters can defile a man, but what comes out can defile the man. So he said to them, are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach? So that means it's just going to pass through the intestinal tract. It's not part of what's going on in the heart. He says it enters his, it doesn't enter his heart, but his stomach and is eliminated thus purifying all food. So in context, irrespective of whether a person eating had performed the prescribed ritual hand washing and they washed up to their elbows, he is actually, what he's saying here right now is Pharisees, your whole oral tradition about touch contamination is void. It's, it's, it doesn't even apply. It's invalid. So what the Pharisees believed was that if you touched a Gentile who had, and that Gentile touched the food or you touched the food, that's going to make the food unclean. I mean, they had all kinds of interesting things that, that they believed. But what Jesus is doing is invalidating the oral tradition of touch contamination. So pointing to the Pharisees' hypocrisy, he's saying, you don't worry about moral purity. Mm. You worry about ritual purity. Mm. And you know, we have to be careful about that ourselves. We have to be careful about putting traditions on people that makes them say, you have to do this, you have to do that. If there's not a thus saith the Lord behind it. So they weren't worried about the kind of food, but only the way it was eaten, had it been contaminated by touch of an unclean person. Sin is not a matter of ritual purity. Sin is a matter of the heart. Purity comes from having an intimate relationship with the Lord. That's where purity comes. As you come and you enter into that covenant relationship with the Lord, you're filled with the Holy Spirit and He begins to cleanse you from the inside out. He begins to change what you're doing. So please understand, we can't ignore the context because if Jesus had eliminated the distinction between clean and unclean foods, why would Peter have responded so vehemently to the idea of eating unclean foods? Let me read Acts 10, 14. This is after Jesus had been resurrected and ascended to heaven. He has the vision of the sheets with the clean and the unclean animals. And the Lord says, get up, rise up and eat. And Peter says in Acts 10, 14, not so, Lord, for I have never 
eaten anything common or unclean. So this vision is actually explained in Acts 11 that God was showing him not to call Gentiles unclean. Jesus was not setting aside the laws of clean and unclean food mm -hmm. that were originally established in Genesis, in Genesis 7, way before the Levitical system. He's not setting these aside. And you will remember in Genesis 7, 1 through 5, God commanded and brought in a pair to unclean animals of each unclean animal, but he brought in seven pair, 14, of each of the clean because more of them were needed, only a clean animal that could be used for sacrifice and only clean foods were permitted to be clean meats to be consumed for food after the flood. So here's, here's what Jesus is saying. You guys have got this backwards. Mm -hmm. You're worried about what you're, what you're bringing from the outside to the inside, but it's inside out that matters. And he goes on, he's going to list some vices that show them. Mark 7, 20 through 23. Jesus says, what comes out of a man that defiles him, that makes him unclean, unholy before the Lord. For what from within, out of the heart of men proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile a man. So when our thoughts become actions, which become, or become words, become actions that are motivated from the evil, rebellious heart of an unchanged, unsanctified person, that's sin, that's moral pollution. And you know, the Bible says that all sin is unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. All sin is contrary to God's government of love. I love the scripture, Proverbs 4.23. It's great advice. It says, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. You know, that's what Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34 and 35. Out of the overflow of the heart, inside out, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, the good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And the evil man brings out evil things out of the evil stored up in him. What is stored in your heart? Mm. Please, we are to store the word, the treasure of God's word, the treasure of time. Let it be stored in our heart. The treasure of spending the Sabbath with God, let that be stored in our heart. And then out of that, when the Holy Spirit's in our heart, Jesus lives in our heart by faith, out of our heart will flow living waters. So we encourage you to remember, in vain are we worshiping if it is just the, if our doctrines are just the commandments of men. Mm, amen. Thank you, Shelley, for that encouragement. My friends, we're going to take a short break and we will be back in just a moment. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Hello, friends. Welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're going to pass it on to Pastor John Dinsey for Tuesday's lesson. Thank you, Pastor Ryan. Uh, the lesson is entitled Crumbs for the Dogs, a very interesting title. Yeah, we go to Mark chapter 7, beginning in verse 24, and there it says, From there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. Now, it's interesting that it says that he entered into a house and wanted no one to know it. And you might say, well, 
didn't Jesus come to seek and to save that which was lost? Why, is, why does he want to hide in this house? Well, for one thing, after you labor all day, you want to rest. But there's another reason, and this is why I go to Mark chapter 1, verse 29. Notice what happens here in Mark 1, 29, then, then verse 32 and 33. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered in the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. And now verse 32, And that evening, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and them that were possessed with devils, and all the city was gathered together at the, at the door. Uh, let me give you another one here. Um, this one is found in Mark 2, chapter 1, Mark chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there, were, there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them. So uh, it would be a uh, serious problem, and he needed some rest. Let's go now to continue the story. We go to Mark chapter 7, verse 25, and it says, For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. So she came to the house and fell at his feet. Now it says in verse 26, The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Now this, uh, the Phoenicians were descendants from the Canaanites and the country, including Tyre and Sidon, uh, was called Phoenicia or Syrophoenicia. And this woman, in essence, was a Gentile. So it's interesting the, the way Jesus uh, speaks with her. And this was a way that most of the rabbis and Jews spoke to Gentiles. Now, why did Jesus speak to her that way? Jesus was testing her faith. We'll, we'll begin with that. Please understand that in John 6, 37, it says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. So he, uh, even though he spoke in a way that seemed strange for us, we do not know the way that Jesus expressed himself and the way he, he expressed the words and the, uh, in, he didn't utter in angry tones. He didn't utter in hateful tones. It was in a manner that he couldn't help himself. He was just, the way he spoke was a way that it would attract people to him. Now in Mark chapter 7, verse 27, notice what it says. But Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first. For it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. This is the New King James Version, and I read to you now from the lesson. It says, He does not openly explain, but there are two characteristics in his response to her suggest that he is teaching. Mark 7, in Mark 7, 27, he says that the children should be fed first. If there is a first, it seems logical that there would be a second. The other characteristic is that Jesus uses a diminutive form of the word dog, not meaning puppies, but rather in context, dogs allowed inside the house in contrast to street dogs. The woman picks up on these two markers in her response to Jesus, which help, ex, helps us explain her response. So you see, the woman was not, didn't feel rejection. The woman uh, saw in this like an invitation Still, in the way Jesus expressed himself, notice what it says in verse 28. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Yeah, so this is a, a thing to say, praise the Lord. She had faith and hope that she would, uh, that would not be deterred. This woman uh, understood that Jesus was somebody that helped people. And so she came because she knew something about Jesus. And she came and worshiped at his feet and expressed her need. And she kept asking, kept asking. It seemed like if Jesus was kind of ignoring her, but it was a test of faith. Knowing Jesus, he came to seek and to save that which was lost and includes also this woman. He knew her need and wanted to help. And notice what it says in verse 29. Then... He said to her, 
for this saying, go your way, the demon has gone out of your daughter. Now, this woman had to take the words of Jesus and believe in them and go home understanding that what Jesus said had just happened. Mm. You know, it's interesting that when Jesus expressed himself, uh, the woman understood that Jesus was, was not saying, hey, I have nothing for you. Don't even bother me. Uh, you know, what I have is only for the Jews. She did not understand that when Jesus said that the, 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 um, the children should be fed first, he said, wait a minute. If they have to be fed first, then others should be fed as well. And she took upon this opportunity and pressed her petition. And this is a lesson for us as well. You know, it may seem that when you pray, there is no answer. Don't give up on the first try. Mm -hmm. Keep bringing to the Lord your concern, your need. Keep bringing to Jesus your need because remember, he's willing to, he's more willing to give good gifts to his children than earthly parents are to give good gifts to their children. Uh, and now it says in verse 30, and when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. So what kind of, ex what kind of reaction <laughs> do you think this woman had? She praised the Lord, I'm sure, and rejoiced in knowing that what Jesus said had happened and she saw it for herself. Uh, so question, would this lady be a witness for Jesus to her people? Yes, she received the blessing that Jesus had given her and surely she spread the good news. Hey, your daughter is well. Yes, Jesus did it. Jesus did it. So this uh, account in Matthew sheds some light in the way that Jesus talked to her. It's interesting the way it is found in Matthew 15, 28. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be done to you as you desire. So in Matthew, in the book of Matthew, it sheds a little, O woman, great is your faith. Jesus saw the faith and he rewarded that faith. And so I encourage you to bring your petitions to the Lord in faith, believing, believing, and this is part of receiving. You must believe that when you come, you will receive a blessing. So uh, I read to you from the lesson again. And actually, this is a quote from Desire of Ages, page 401. It says, by his dealings with her, he has shown that she who has been regarded as an outcast from Israel is no longer an alien, but a child in God's household. As a child, it is her privilege to share in the Father's gifts. Mm. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. And I bring to you again, he that comes to Jesus will not be cast out. Uh, I read to you now from Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 26. It says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. To Jesus we are all one. He loves us, each and every one. There's no uh, race or nation or people favored above another in Jesus' eyes. We are all one in Christ Jesus. That's why it's beautiful to understand there's neither Jew nor Greek. We are all one. We are all one in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Verse 29, Galatians 3, 29. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Mm -hmm. What? We can be heirs? Yes. Heirs according to the promise if we believe in Jesus. Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. It says, Where there is neither uh, Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bar nor free, but Christ is all and in all. So be encouraged. God loves you and bring your request to Him because He loves you. Amen. Amen. I love the story of the Syrophoenician woman. That Amen. always touches my heart. Pastor James Rafferty here. I have a Wednesday's lesson, which is entitled Tongue Tied. And we're in Mark chapter 7, 31 to 37. 
And we're just picking up right where Pastor, uh, Pastor Denzi left off, Mark chapter uh, 7, beginning with verse 31. Mark 7, 31. And again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, just got done healing the Sea of Phoenician's woman's daughter. He came unto the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Decapolis, in verse 32. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they beseech him to put his hand upon him. And he took him outside or aside from the multitude. He put his fingers into his ear. He spit and touched his tongue. Now, this is one of those, I just think it's strange, a little bit strange, <laughs> what's going on here with Christ and the way that he's dealing with this man. But as I started looking at this, and I looked at a little bit of commentary, Matthew Henry's commentary is really good on this. I looked at a little bit of commentary and it just started opening up some really amazing insights to me. And so I want to share some of this with you. Christ took him aside from the multitude, Mark 7, 33. Ordinarily, he wrought his miracles publicly before all the people to show that they would bear the strictest scrutiny and inspection. But this he did privately to show that he did not seek his own glory and to teach us to avoid everything that savors of ostentation. Mm. Let us learn of Christ to be humble, to do good where no eye sees mm. but his eye. Mm. I really like that. So there were times when Christ said, you know what, I'm gonna do this privately because people are gonna be looking at me, they're gonna be looking at the way that I heal, and at times they're gonna to need to just kind of be low, be, be unseen, just do things behind the curtain, so to speak, and not be always seen and maybe even exploited for what they're doing. A lot of times people put their stuff out there in order to get a following and Christ isn't about that. He's about directing everything to God. It continues on here and it says, he used more significant actions in doing this cure than usual. Right, of course he did. He put fingers into his ears as if he would syringe them and fetch out that which stopped them up. He spit upon his own finger and then touched his tongue as if he would moisten his mouth and so loosen that which his tongue, with which his tongue was tied. These were no treatments that could in the least contribute to the cure. Mm -hmm. So, so glad to understand that, right? He wasn't curing him by putting the, the fingers in his ears or by, you know, putting the, the spit on his tongue. No, but only signs of the exerting of that power which Christ had in him to encourage his faith and the faith of those who brought him. In other words, when you go to visit a doctor, you know, they're gonna take out their little stethoscope and all these stuff and they're gonna open your mouth and point a light in there and they're gonna put this thing on your chest and they're gonna, and you, you get the impression that they're, they're doing something. <laughs> they, they know what they're doing. <laughs> Something's gonna happen here. And so Christ is doing all of this, not because he needs to do it, but he's doing it to encourage faith in the man himself and in others who brought him to, to Christ to be healed. The application was all from himself. It showed, uh, excuse me, it was his own fingers that he put into his ears, his own spittle that he put up on his tongue. He alone heals. Christ alone heals. Mm -hmm. Then verse 30, th the first 34 says, And looking up to heaven, Christ sighed and said unto him, Ethpatha, that is, be opened. He looked up to heaven to give his father the praise of what he did. For he sought his praise and he did his will. And as mediator, he acted in dependence upon him with an eye to him. In other words, Christ would say, of my own self, I can do what? Nothing. Nothing. I, oh. And of course, we need that same phrase. We need that same motif in our own lives. Of our own self, I can do nothing. And I'll tell you, as you, if we get further in ministry, I mean, 10 years down, 20 years down, 30 years down, 40 years down, it's harder and harder to, to think that way. You know, because you look back and you think, well, I, I wrote this book and I, I preached this sermon and I, I, I did this, you know, God has really used me in a powerful way and there must be something I can contribute. And again and again, Christ reminds us, no, actually all of this comes from heaven. All of this, I'm, I'm using you as a channel. I'm using you in spite of yourself. And every once in a while, we have to kind of trip over ourselves again and uh, God lifts us up and realize, ah, just like Peter, you know, I don't have the agape, I don't have the filet, I don't have in me, I don't have what I really need to be your ambassador, to be your t preacher, to be the minister, the discipler that you've called me to be. But you, 
you can do all things through me and in spite of me. Thus he signified that it was by a divine power, a power that he had as the Lord from heaven, as that he did this, that is, as he had from God that he did this, for the hearing ear and the seeing eye that the Lord has made, and he can remake even both of them. He also hereby directed his patient who could see, though he could not hear, to look to heaven for relief. So mm. Jesus does something that actually his patient can duplicate, right? He looks up and the patient says, oh, oh, we're looking up. He can do that. He can't hear, he can't talk, but he can do what Jesus does. Mm. I love that because many times when Jesus takes us where we are, he shows us the things that we can actually do, the things that we can actually, actually replicate, that, that we can actually follow his example in. Moses was, uh, I was stammering with his tongue and he was directed to look that way in Exodus 4 verse 11. Who has made man's mouth, the Lord replied to him, or who makes the dumb or the deaf or the seeing, excuse me, who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind, have not I the Lord? And God, in other words, God, according to Exodus 4 verse 11, God is able to remake and remake each and every one of us to speak for him, to see for him, to listen for him, to work for him, to ministry, minister for him. He sighed. Jesus sighed. I just wonder about that. What is, why was he sighing? It's not as if he found any difficulty in working this miracle or obtaining power to do it from his father, but he sighed to express his pity for the miseries of human life and his sympathy with the afflicted in their affliction as one that was himself touched with the feelings of their infirmities. And as to this man, he sighed not because he had loathed to do him this kindness. In other words, not because he was hesitant to do this kindness to him or reluctant to do this kindness to him, but because of the many temptations which he would be exposed to and the sins he would be in danger of now that his tongue was loosed <laughs> after restoring his speech to him. Well, which, was, which before he didn't have, he now was going to be able to say things speak things and communicate things that he never had the power to do before. And so Jesus must have been thinking, I pray as I heal this man that he will have grace to keep his mouth as with a bridle, right? Psalm 39 and verse one. So God wants to heal us. He wants to heal all of us, but sometimes healing us like with Hezekiah, sometimes healing us isn't really the best option for us. Sometimes God is reluctant to heal us because he sees what that healing may bring in our lives. And so whenever we heal, whenever we pray for people to be healed, we always pray according to your will, Lord, whatever your will is in this situation, because you know what the future holds for this person. Verse 35, and straightway his ears were opened and the string of his tongue was loosed and he spake plain. So before his tongue was stammering, he could speak and you could kind of try to make out what he was saying, but now he's speaking plainly. And so Jesus charged them that they should tell no man but the more they char he charged them, so much the more, a great deal they published it. I, you just have to think about this. You know, Jesus has just healed them. He's the Messiah. He's, you know, he's taken charge of the situation. Don't tell anyone. We're going to tell. No, don't tell. We're going to tell. Don't tell. We're going to tell. It, he ordered it to be kept very private, but it was made very public, right? It was his humility that he charged them that they should tell no man. It was in his humility. Most men will proclaim their own goodness or at least desire that others should proclaim it, right? But Christ through his, through, though he was in no danger of being puffed up with it himself, knowing that we are would set us an example of self-denial as in other things, so, so especially in praise and applause. We should take pleasure in doing good, but not in its being known that we're doing good. And that really is the final frontier for many of us as fallen human beings. It was their zeal that, though he charged them to say nothing of it, yet they published it before Christ would have not published it. They meant honestly and therefore is reckoned to them rather as an act of indiscretion than an act of disobedience. And verse 37, the final verse, and were beyond measure astonished, saying, He has done all things well. He makes, makes both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. And that's exactly right, friends. Christ has done all things well. And this is the place where we need this scripture to come in because he's just 
a label to see a Phoenician woman, in a sense, as a little dog or in a way that would put many of us off. And that's what I love about that story, that she pushed through all of that with this great faith, as Matthew's account gives us. Jesus does all things well. So whatever we make of that account, we need to reckon with this scripture in verse 37. Jesus does all things well, and he does do all things well. We need to trust him for that. Mm -hmm. Would you trust him for that? Thank you very much. I love, I love hearing the stories of Jesus told and taught, both of them together. Just the telling of the story uh, fills us with something that is useful and good in our lives. My name is Daniel Perrin, and I have Thursday's lesson, which is watch out for bad bread. And I want to start with the prayer that Jesus teaches his disciples and in turn us to pray, which includes that line, give us this day our daily bread. And this would be our sustenance that we must ask for both physically and spiritually. All blessings come from God. And then we have to keep our eyes open because there's an enemy who says, oh, they desire bread. Well, let me give them something that will, that will look good, that will look satisfying and substitute for what they really need. And they will take that as a gift from God. So we need to be on the alert and have God anointing our eyes and our understanding. Now we're moving through uh, down into Mark chapter 8 a little bit and we skip over this story of the feeding of the 4,000. Uh, go back to Mark chapter 6, I think, chapter 6, and there was the feeding of the 5,000. And then as I've been listening here, each one, I, I feel like bread has come up. There's been crumbs, there's been food, and, and the, the idea of what we eat in bread really is a daily issue for every one of us and it's a part of what Jesus teaches. Now the Pharisees are going to come to Jesus here after the feeding of the 4,000 and they're going to ask him a question that is going to turn inside out. They're going to take what should be on the inside and bring it on the outside. They're just, they're going to turn things upside down and they're going to look at things a totally wrong way with some convincing arguments that are going to begin to uh, perhaps influence the disciples and Jesus is going to press back against that. So start with me in Mark chapter 8 verse 11. It says, then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him. So they're coming out for an argument, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. But he sighed, and there's that word again, deeply in his spirit. So you get the same sense of Jesus' caring for humanity and for these people individually. And he said, why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. And he left them and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. Now the lesson asks here, what approach or rather what motive by the Pharisees deeply disappointed Jesus? And the, the approach or the motive is that they already exhibited an attitude of prejudice against him. After all, looking back at chapter 3, they had already accused him of having an evil spirit by which he was casting out other evil spirits. So they've got these preconceived objections. And when they come asking for a sign, are they really seeking a sign? If Jesus were to give them the sign that they wanted, would they be convinced? They're seeking a fight. They're seeking some way to twist words, and Jesus is 100% aware of that. And it seems as if the multitudes are too, that they're disturbed by the treatment that Jesus is receiving. Look at Mark chapter 3:20 that we've been through before. It says, the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat, and there's the word again, bread. Uh, <laughs> Jesus is, and his disciples are pressed here. The multitude are gathering around him. The lesson asks this, uh, why not demonstrate his divine power and convince these cavillers? Cavilling means to raise petty and unnecessary objections or excuses. I mean, if only he proved it, and this is what we would probably do. Jesus, give him a sign, strike him blind. I mean, you did that in the Old Testament, didn't you? What, what would happen if, if you struck them all deaf? Uh, if, if you made it dark, they would believe you then, wouldn't they? The lesson goes on and continues. The problem goes back to the end of Mark 3, where Jesus speaks of the sin against the Holy Spirit. If one's ears are shut and eyes are closed, another miracle, even a sign from heaven, will not convince them. Mm -hmm. 
Kind of like that story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. Even if I sent someone back from the dead, if they've not accepted the words of God, nothing else is going to convince them. Mm -hmm. There are some people, and may it not be us, who will not be convinced even with the straight words of the Bible. Let's continue on in verse 14. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. And they did not have, uh, and they did, and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them. This is Jesus saying, "Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod." So he's speaking of spiritual realities here, of the leaven about about skepticism and mistrust spreading. And you think about the Pharisees and Herod, two opposed people, and yet they're we're going to see that they're united a couple places here in the book of Mark. Uh, Herod is one who later on is going to demand of Jesus a sign. And so it says the disciples reasoned among themselves, verse 16, saying, is it because we've brought no bread? Uh, it is because we brought no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not perceive? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? And then Jesus points them back to the signs. He says, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? He said to him, 12. Also, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said, seven. So he said to them, how is it that you do not understand? See, the disciples here are getting caught in the same trap. They're starting to, to ask the same questions, perhaps. And Jesus says, I've given you all the signs. Take a look, remember, ponder, perceive the things that I've taught you. And we've got those same signs. Every one of us can look back and see the way God has, in line with the word of God, been involved in our life, leading us on from truth to truth. So what had the disciples forgotten? And uh, the lesson asks, what did they forget and what point did Jesus want to make? Well, number one, they had forgotten that uh, the Pharisees were opponents of Jesus and they were tenacious, vindictive spirit and they were not dealing with the hearts of sincere people. Sometimes people will raise objections to our faith or to the word of God and we have to recognize sometimes those things do not come from a sincere spirit. I was distributing some literature just about a week ago and someone wanted to question me and, he, and it was very clear he had no interest in a conversation and so I, I shared with him just briefly and moved on uh, and because there were those later in the day who did want to converse and talk about things. And number two, the disciples are not seeing the distinction between carnal and spiritual. Uh, the physical world, the carnal world, illustrates the spiritual realities. And so all they see is the bread. Well, maybe Jesus is looking around and seeing, we just have one loaf of bread. What's that all about? And, and so Jesus wants to turn their eyes to the fact that he is teaching spiritual lessons. So a couple of lessons to think about here. Uh, the Pharisees' request is really a distraction, and we can get involved in some distractions like this one. We can be distracted with spiritual bread, uh, with not recognizing that spiritual and physical bread are not synonymous. Listen to Isaiah 55 verse 2. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. So often we get our eyes fixated on things like financial security or our children are making it through college and they're getting good grades or our little children are obeying us and we have a clean house. So we begin to think, all right, if I can get all these things in order, that, then I, it'll be, it will be a sign that I am being blessed by God. Those things are not necessarily the good bread. They may come later, but that's not really what it's all about. Uh, Luke 12, 15 describes this when Jesus talks about the rich fool when he says, uh, and he said to him, take heed and beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. And so this is, this is when we focus on the physical rather than the spiritual that God gives us. Let's think of one other here. Uh, there's a warning for us. Do not change the order of spiritual prosperity. Everything God created has a divine order. Relationships, nature, even the church, even our families have a divine order. And 1 Timothy 6.6 6 gives us that order. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. 
And so the world wants to distract us and, and flip those around to two distortions. Great gain with contentment is godliness. If I have a lot and I feel happy, that must be an indication that I'm doing the right thing. That's not all, always true. Or the other distortion, that godliness with great gain is contentment. If I have the feeling that all is going well and I'm happy with it, well, and, and, and I'm, I'm gaining a lot, then that must be what makes me content. That's not really what it is. We really need our hearts to be focused on listening to God's word and listening to him and opening to the reality of his love. And what that means is that we ponder his truths day by day. As soon as you wake up in the morning and say, Lord, give me the spiritual needs that I need today. I don't, and, and then uh, don't let me wander off in seeking things that are simply for my own pleasure, but don't glorify and honor you. Amen. Wow. Praise the Lord. This was a powerful lesson. Um, Mark chapter seven and uh, portions of Mark eight as well. I just want to praise God for the lessons that we've learned. And I want to take the time to give our panelists uh, an opportunity to give some final thoughts. A clean hands and a clean heart. You know, the thought that's coming to mind right now, God calls us to be fishers of men, not cleaners of the fish. He cleans us by the power of the Holy Spirit from inside out. So your job is to teach people about Jesus, introduce them to the power of the Holy Spirit and let him do the sanctifying. Amen, amen. You know, one of the lessons that Jesus was trying to teach the disciples is that you are not better than others. Mm -hmm. yeah, notice what it says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the, by the gospel. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. And God wants us to remind us that wherever, whatever our situation is, whatever our condition is, that God is here to heal us. And sometimes those outward healings aren't as significant as the inward healings, the spiritual healings. God wants to heal us spiritually and not just physically. Summary of Thursday's lesson, don't let the physical things distract you or don't let unnecessarily objections distract you from the clear signs God has given both in his word and the Holy Spirit's conviction upon your heart. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, it's easy for us to get caught up in the leaven of the Pharisees or every wind of doctrine that can, of course, pull us away from the word of God if we are not rooted and grounded in his word. We've talked a lot about bread today. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And of course, we are to allow his word to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So again, hide the Lord's word in your heart that you might not sin against him. That's what Psalm says. And so get into the word each and every day, because the more you're in God's word, the more it's rooted and grounded in you. And therefore you will not get caught up in those, uh, those darts that the devil might throw at you from time to time. Uh, next week, we're excited about lesson number seven. We're going to be diving into a lesson that's entitled Teaching Disciples Part One. We'll see you right back here next week.